went to night school, I had uh, a, uh, I, I, I searched for very handsome young ladies who uh, only spoke English. That, that is a great help. I listened to the radio. Uh, I, I kind of tried to make a living by writing stories in German which were translated and I sold a couple here and made a few thousand dollars. And uh, uh, ultimately I, uh, I sold one of those to, to Paramount and uh, they gave me a little bit of a uh, contract there. In those days, I'm talking now about 1934, uh, all studios had uh, a huge amount of uh, writers under contract. We had to deliver, like, I think it was 11 pages every Thursday. We had to hand in 11 pages of script. And uh, you were assigned to pictures, and you wrote two, three, four, four pictures. You were taken off pictures. You were rewriting pictures. It was like great, a great big assembly line, a factory. And uh, uh, the lucky break we got was uh, that uh, the head of the writer's department, he had an idea of teaming me up with Charles Brackett a novelist, very learned and elegant man. And he took us to see uh, Lubitsch, who was making two pictures at the time. He was looking for, for uh, people who could write a script on Bluebeard's Hate's Wife, and that's the way we started. Subsequently, uh, we stayed with Lubitsch uh, for Ninochka. I think working for Lubitsch was a very important step to improve your craft. Uh, absolutely, enormously. Did you feel like many writers working in Hollywood at that time that the system was very constricting? Well, yeah, it was constricting, except that if you made a name for yourself, it was beginning to become uh, to become uh, an honorable profession, which it was then not, you know, because uh, uh, people came to Hollywood, you know, to make quick money. Writers from New York, stage actors, novelists, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, whom I knew at Paramount, by the way, uh, Faulkner, uh, they would all kind of. Uh, 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 put their fingers in the pie, you know, but it, not with any genuine interest. They kind of looked down on movies, which, uh, you know, is my delight, you know, because everybody has been looking down on movies, you know, uh, as something kind of third rate, up until, thank God, the invention of television. Now we have something to look down on. Ball of Fire, directed by Howard Hawks, was your last script before becoming a filmmaker. Yeah, I wanted to direct. In fact, I spent all of my time on the set with Hawks and watched him during the shooting. I didn't take uh, any salary. I just took a little learning vacation. You wanted to, to, to go direct. into directing because you, you feel your, your scripts were not, were betrayed or you, not you wanted betrayed. to have more control? Not, yeah, I wanted to have more control and uh, uh, you know, I, I just thought that directing was all the fun. Uh, writing is misery, writing is sweat, writing is hard labor. The fun is to be on the set if you have a good script and, uh, and uh, capable uh, or uh, if you're lucky enough to have outstanding actors. That's real fun, you know. That's the, that's the, the, the thing to do. You mean the writing is the toughest part of, of the filmmaking? Well, of so you, it's, it's too much to, to do the toughest part and somebody else does Absolutely, the, easy, the, yeah. the, the holiday. It's like making the bed for somebody and then, then he hops into the bed, you know, and I go home, you know. I remember at one time we had written a script uh, for Mitchell Eisen and Arthur Hornblow, the producer, called uh, uh, Hold Back the Dawn with uh, Boyer and with Olivia de Havilland and uh, Paulette Gardet and a slew of other actors. And uh, it, uh, the basic point of the script was, uh, of the story, of the theme was, uh, the, 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 the uh, Romanian gigolo who would like to get into the United States but doesn't have a visa. So he's now waiting for the quota number to come up in some lousy hotel in Tijuana across the border. And he was lying there on the couch, unshaven and disheveled. And, uh, and uh, there was a cockroach, I'm quoting the script now, a cockroach was trying to kind of climb up the dirty wall and onto a little mirror that was there. And uh, he had a, a little, little walking stick there or something, and he would stop that cockroach any time it wanted to, wanted to get onto the mirror and say, wait a minute, where are you going? Have you got a visa? That was basically the scene. So uh, I remember there was a restaurant across the street called Lucy's and we went to lunch there, Brackett and I. And I ran into Boyer and I said, to, what are you doing? He says, well, we're doing this scene uh, in, the, in the hotel. He says, oh yes, that scene with the cockroach, it's a good scene, isn't it? And the Boyer said, yes, sir. You think it's a good scene? He says, we cut it out because I, I, I refuse to do it. I said, why? And uh, boy, he said, well, it's, it's stupid, it's idiotic. He says, uh, 
why should I talk to a cockroach if a cockroach cannot answer me? I'm not going to talk to a cockroach. Uh, and I looked at Brackett, Brackett looked at me and we got very, very angry and we went back to the office and we were still writing the, the final 20 minutes of that film. And I was so angry, I said, I tell you, I tell you, this son of a bitch, if he doesn't talk to a cockroach, he won't talk to anybody. And we gave him the absolute minimum for the end. We gave everything to Olivia de Havilland out of anger, you know. Now, what had happened was, you know, that at this time, Paramount was making like 40, 45 pictures a year. They said, well, we, we like uh, Brackett and Wilder as a team. We don't want to lose them. If that silly guy wants to break his neck, you know, how good can it be? And they let me... Uh, direct my very first picture. But I knew what they were thinking. So I found a story that was absolutely kind of foolproof. It was the major and the minor with uh, Ginger Rogers. And uh, we got uh, Milan, with whom I worked subsequently. And I made a small, uh, very successful picture. It was a rather mild, chaste version of Lolita. That's what it was. That 24-year-old girl doesn't have enough money to get back on the train, but has enough money for a child's ticket, which is half price, and disguises herself as a child and runs into Raimi Land, who finds himself curiously sexually attracted by not knowing, and it disturbs him greatly. Since that was a success, they gave me contact and I stayed on as a director. But you were not really satisfied with the system because you wanted to achieve more control. You switched from scriptwriter to director and then director to producer, producer-director. And that is the level of the producer who, uh, I'm not talking now about great producers like the Thorbergs and the Selznicks and, uh, and uh, the, the, the Goldwins. Um, I'm talking about a uh, studio producer who, uh, you know, since they cannot uh, write, since they cannot direct, since they cannot act, since they cannot compose, they become the, the, the head of everything. And that was the ultimate control. So it was a question of, uh, not of power, but of, uh, of uh, ultimately having it as close to, on the screen, to what you, what you first imagined, uh, to have it as close to that after the e execution. Ace in the Hole was your first film as a producer? And uh, believe me, it was a very, very harsh experience. I almost left Paramount because uh, uh, because uh, that was before I had the controls, the cutting control and other controls. They just uh, retitled the picture, you know, it was uh, Ace in the Hole, they called it the big carnival to recoup some money. Then it was a success in Europe. But uh, I, I, I learned my lesson, you know, I, I insisted on certain things, you know, so they cannot go behind my back and suddenly the picture is uh, uh, retitled, it is, uh, it is recut, it is uh, redubbed, rescored, you know. That is very important. But however, however, being a very fast uh, uh, picture, shooter, shooter of pictures, a uh, picture maker, and, uh, and uh, not, uh, not indulging in, uh, in uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, masturbatory self-exercises of, of, uh, of uh, 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 egocentric uh, uh, self-satisfaction, you know? I, I ultimately achieved the, 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 the cutting rights from the studio, which is about the, the best that you can hope for. It only walks about 5% of the time, but just strikes out 5% of the time. Come on, Dodgers! Whoa, Hold up! Over there is the airport, and this is where 20th Century Park used to be. And this is the beach, this is where our house is, way out there. Now how about the drink? Let's go inside, huh? There's a little kind of uh, catapult and stuff, uh, Roman things, and my little Japanese dwarf trees. Come with me now, please. All right, now let's see. Here we have a couple of Picassos, and then we have uh, a Javlensky and a Vuya and a Brack and a Chagall and a portrait of Kandinsky by Gabriel Munter, another Javlensky. Then we have here the two nudes by Kirchner. Then we have uh, another nude by Suzanne Valadon, a Dufy Promenade des Anglais. A blue Picasso, a watercolor by 
Renoir, another Picasso, and way in the corner there we have a, a Giacometti. And naturally in back of it, you know, other paintings where I don't even know where to hang them yet. When did you start collecting all those paintings? Oh, about um, 50 years ago, way back in Berlin. And I don't even consider myself a collector. I consider myself an accumulator. I have accumulated things. Like a, like a pack rat, you know? I, I cannot help myself. I, I just have that, that sickness. I've got to buy and acquire, and I've got too much stuff, and I've got it hidden under, under the beds, and in closets, and in warehouses. I just cannot stop buying, buying, buying. What does it correspond to? Uh, I don't know, greed, if you want to call it, or, or curiosity, or passion. But uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is not an eclectic uh, kind of, uh, or let us say, not a, a Catholic uh, kind of a collection. I also collect uh, Japanese dwarf trees and uh, glass paperweights and uh, uh, Chinese jar. You just name it, I collect it. But uh, what is striking is that uh, you, you tend to, to like uh, extremely avant-garde or abstract painting. And uh, we know that in, in matters of, of films, you are a, a classic. I don't think there's a contradiction. I, I really think that I am an adventurer myself. I do not mind uh, progress. I do not mind uh, uh, something totally new, something revolutionary, if it makes sense and if it belongs. What I hate is, uh, is uh, what I would call the, the, the phony uh, uh, innovator, who to begin with is not an innovator at all because they have done everything before in. Uh, in Russia and at the old Ufa company in Berlin, you know, there's nothing really new. But people who kind of uh, do crazy stuff in order to astonish the middle class man, a party le bourgeois, I, I, I don't subscribe to that whatsoever. And yet, yourself, you shocked film people with The Lost Weekend by showing the drama of an alcoholic. At that time, they used to make light comedies on the subject. And in Ace in the Hall, you expose the methods of the yellow journalist who lets a man die for a scoop. And also, later, in Some Like It Hot... On uh, Some Like It Hot, I had no difficulties whatsoever. There was, uh, uh, there was some uh, super uh, uh, sensitive critics, some, not many, who uh, said Mr. Wilder finds it necessary to uh, find comedy in transvestitism, having men dressed as women, or he digs deep into the old uh, Charlie's Ant cliché and so But as far as the studio is concerned, I had no difficulties whatsoever. The vital thing was how Tony Curtis and I would look in the makeup when we were spending, as I mentioned earlier, 85% of the film, you know, dressed as girls and running around in drag. How the wigs would look and how the makeup would look. Would it be believable? That being crucial, we spent, oh, almost a week every day going through a series of makeup tests and different sized lips with a lipstick and different wigs, and we were going crazy. When we got, Tony and I, what we thought were the right makeups, Billy said, uh, okay, he says, now, we were on the Samuel Goldwyn lot where we shot. He says, go to the ladies' room. And we said, what? He said, you go to the ladies' room. They were going to find out whether this works or not. He says, go to the ladies' room. So in we went, and boy, the flop sweat was flying. I was scared to death. I felt so embarrassed. But in we went. All the women going in and out accepted us. They just thought that we were extras or bit players doing a film, a period piece in which we would be dressed in these costumes. They thought we were women. And uh, we came out, came back, and said to Billy, not one woman batted an eyeball. He said, that's it. Don't change anything. That's the way you're going to look. After the war, or just at the end of the war, you were one of the first directors in Hollywood who decided to shoot on location, to go into the streets for a Lost Weekend, Double Indemnity, and later Sunset Boulevard. Why was this? Last weekend, uh, I wanted to catch the atmosphere of New York. I needed, uh, I needed Third Avenue. At that time, there was still an elevator going up above. I needed that. It needed long, vast vistas of uh, of New York, of skyscrapers, of uh, when he's uh, going up Third Avenue, uh, you know, trying to hack the, to pawn the typewriter because he needs money for some more uh, booze. Uh, 